abusive spouses and all, just even molestations. And you know, thinking they can just confess it and that everything's okay. Now, I know there's millions of people preaching it that way. But that leads to death and destruction. Ruin in this life and absolute chaos and ruin in the afterlife. So you have a supposed relationship with Christ that you think because of this feeling you might have sometimes because you're remorseful for what you did. You got drunk and you did all these horrible things and you're just remorseful for it and you come crying back to the pastor. You come crying back to the evangelist. But unless you forsake those things and empty yourself of all guile and deceit and your double-minded ways, thinking that you got some kind of magic cover because the missions and all the preachers out there are saying so, then you're not going to be have any relationship whatsoever with Christ. True repentance results in purity of heart and obedience to the truth. For godly sorrow that produces repentance unto salvation is not to be regretted or repented of. Like it says in the King James Version, both, both words are repentant in that sentence. The sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner and it produced diligence and a clearing of wrongdoing and indignation and fear and a vivant desire change and zeal and vindication of the past life that you lived. In all these things you prove yourself to be clear or pure in this matter. That's 2 Corinthians 7, 10, and 11. We quoted hundreds of times. Clearly that's what repentance will produce. But magic words and magic covers and magic transfers that never took place only in the minds of some theologian that wanted an excuse for his sins are not going to set you free and purify your heart. So you're always going to be double-minded. You're always going to be deceitful. You're always going to have this duplicity in your life, falling back into your old ways. Now, I know you ask, well, you mean one sin? One act, in, one act of immortality, immorality and uncleanness and drunkenness, uh, whatever else, will automatically disqualify me from the kingdom? Just one time? I do it? Yeah. Yeah. It only took one sin in the garden. One single act of willful transgression against God's known command. It's already stated that it will disqualify you from the kingdom. The day that you do this, you will surely die. That's all it takes. Only one. But see, you say, well, if that's so, well then how can anybody ever really be saved? Because you can't comprehend a life without doing these things. See, if you never stop sinning to begin with, which most professed Christians out there, they've never really emptied their heart, guile. They've never really become pure in their faith. So they, don't, they can't comprehend these things because they've never been redeemed, born of God and sinneth not. They've not experienced that. They're sinning daily by their own omission. So it's impossible that this could be true, that one sin, if I just one time, oh, you know, I was good for the last two months, and then, ah, oh, man, I got drunk and committed adultery, fornication. Yeah, you know, every, every, it happens to everybody. See, they can't comprehend the fact that a person could live free from those things in Christ if they genuinely came to him to begin with. Again, back to that Hebrews 10 passage. It's a dire circumstance if you sin willfully against your precise and correct knowledge, is what that word means, knowledge, of the truth. No sacrifice remains, but a certain fearful expectation of fire, indignation, and judgment that will devour the adversary. Anyone who rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Like I said, deliberate sin, presumptuous sin. He died. There was no, no sacrifices could be made for those. How much worse punishment do you suppose he will be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? You see, he was sanctified. He's talking to real Christians here, not phonies, the repeat after me crowd. Counted it a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace. You see what I'm saying? That's what it teaches about falling into these type of sins that you think you can simply confess and pick up where you left off. Now, if you don't mean that, then please clarify what you mean when you post things on the channels and the blogs. 
Otherwise, I have to assume that you're in the same camp with the darkness and light people, the good and bad fruit. See, grace raised the bar. It didn't lower it. It didn't give anybody some kind of magic cover. Like the pastors think and, and all the abundance out there. Because grace empowers you to live a godly life that God requires. With no excuse for sin. And that ruin for the rest of your life. But you have to obey God. Right from the start. Come to Him on His terms and not yours. And come clean with Him in repentance. And stop playing the sin confess game. Making excuses and studying the scriptures to find another excuse for, for sin or listen to some pundit that's got it all worked out real neat that how you're dead to the law and you don't, you don't have to worry about it. Quit doing those things. And nobody's perfect and, and all this sin nature and, and I can't do it and, and all that other stuff. And just come before God. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Let your laughter return to mourning and your joy to the gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of God. That's what he, that is the self-cleansing humility of a repent. There's nothing proud about doing what's right in repentance. Coming before God, it's the most humiliating experience that a man can be lowered to the dust before the Lord. To bring you to a real redemption and a return to favor. So this first John 1 8 excuse that people keep making, this sin nature hoax, this Business that they always going to have sin in me. And if I say I don't, I'm a liar. No, you're lying to yourself. By calling us liars. Because you know you're not keeping what he said. You know you're not putting forth the effort. You know you, you think God, Jesus did it for you. And that's the type of punish you go after. Instead of digging into the scriptures yourself. And finding out. You know what it means to come to God what it means to sin no more see people like that they mock God's moral laws and his commandments to clean up their act they're going to reap what they sow it's inevitable no matter what they think is true or how much they can, they can refute everything I said or th things I might have forgot to say in this, in this lesson and I suppose there's many many things it doesn't make any difference because you're in the same boat if you argue in favor of sin. And it's your choice to examine the truth, examine what's in your heart, and choose what you're going to do about this. I say I had, if I say I have never sinned in the past, I would be a liar. Yes, a sin in the past. But I'm not sinning daily in thought, word, and deed. I'm not walking in vileness and thinking I can pick up where I left off if I commit adultery or some other vile act. Because that's not even to be mentioned among the saints that's fitting among the saints. To abstain from the very appearance of evil. But see, you wouldn't have that imperative in your life if you came clean with God. You would have. You would have a faith that works by love, that purifies the heart by obedience to the truth, and has victory over sin, the flesh, and the devil. You would have that kind of a faith. And you'd join us and argue in favor of righteousness. As the past preachers, preachers of righteousness, not preachers of filthy rags. So that's the lesson, if I say I have no sin. Once and for all, try to get it into your thinking, into your head that you've been dwelt and brainwashed into this. That John could not have been teaching that you can sin confess all day long and follow Christ. That you must come clean with Him and live a pure life of righteousness and obedience.